Cumulative upkeep is an old keyword that's entirely a downside. How it works is that every upkeep you put an age counter in a permit with the cumulative upkeep, then you have to sacrifice unless you pay the cost for each age counter on the card, which is usually pain, mana, or life. And this is a pretty bad downside to have in a card, so the card needs to be really strong to see any play. So today we're looking over the best cards that have this old keyword. Starting us off at number 10, we have Energy Storm. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 1 and 1 white. It has cumulative upkeep of 1 mana, meaning on the first turn it's out, you have to pay 1 mana, and then 2, and then 3, and so on and so on. It has the abilities where you prevent all damage that would be dealt by instant or sorcery spells, and creatures with flying don't untap during their controller's untap step. Flying, for anyone who's new, is a keyword where a creature with flying can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. Energy Storm can be really annoying for certain decks to deal with. It's obviously a huge headache for any deck that relies on flying creatures, as locking down all the creatures will make it really hard for them to win. However, this is a little bit of a niche application, as there aren't that many decks that rely that heavily on creatures with flying. However, one area where Energy Storm really excels is being able to completely stop all burn spells. Cheap, efficient burn spells like Lightning Bolt are one of the main attractions of playing red. The combination of being a great removal spell and letting red decks push extra damage through without going to combat means that the cards were basically always live. The cards are so good that in formats like Modern, one of the best aggro decks is Burn, which just casts as many copies of cards like Lightning Bolt as it can, and can end the game by turn 4 with no problem at all. Considering how this card can completely shut down your opponent, it's surprising that Energy Storm has seen very little competitive success. This really goes to show just how bad of a downside cumulative upkeep is. While it can be very strong in certain decks, it doesn't win you the game on its own like it might look like it does. Because you have to play more and more mana to keep it around, it very quickly starts eating up all your mana for a turn, making it so you can't really get any closer to winning the game. Rather, you'll be using your entire turn to stop your opponent from winning, and the whole time your opponent is drawing more cards, filling their hand with more burn spells to kill you, or getting closer to an out for Storm. It's basically impossible to keep Energy Storm, or any of these cumulative upkeep cards, up for the entire game, so your opponent will eventually get all their cards back online, and be able to pull off their game plan again. This means that the cards don't really shut down your opponent, but rather slow down the game for a few turns for you to try and find a way to close the game. On top of how detrimental the upkeep cost is, Energy Storm isn't really in a great spot in the metagame. The card is only legal in Legacy, Vintage, and Commander, and in those formats, burn decks aren't really viable, and locking down flyers just isn't worth it either. So Energy Storm has seen even less play than it likely would if it were printed for a format like Pioneer or Modern. And at number 9, we have Jotun Grunt. This is a 4-4 giant soldier with a mana cost of 1 and 1 white. It has cumulative upkeep of put 2 cards from a single graveyard at the bottom of their owner's library. A 4-4 four four for 2 mana is pretty overstatted, so it makes sense that wizards would add a cumulative upkeep cost to Grunt to keep it in line. In formats like Modern Legacy, most decks are playing fetch lands, which are lands that allow you to tap them, pay 1 life, and sacrifice them to go find a land of a specific type and put them into the battlefield. Combine this with the all very powerful cheap instant and sorcery cards in those formats like Lightning Bolt and Brainstorm, and graveyards will usually be quite full. Despite this, keeping the Grunt alive for more than a few turns is still pretty impractical. Once you have to put around 6 cards back, the likelihood that there are enough cards in the graveyard to keep Grunt alive is basically zero. Especially since the Grunt had to put 6 cards back over the last 2 turns to stay alive anyway. If you're going to try and intentionally mill yourself or your opponent to keep Grunt alive, there are better payoffs for that kind of thing. Self-milling decks will get more mileage out of cards like Prize Amalgam, and decks built around milling your opponent are better off trying to completely deck them out to win that way. The final nail in the coffin for Grunt is the fact that there are other creatures that are just better at being big, cheap threats, namely Tarmogoyf. Despite these shortcomings, Grunt has seen some competitive play in the past in red-white burn decks and Legacy Death and Taxes decks, but it hasn't seen play in either of those decks in the past several years, so its days in the sun are likely over. And at number 8, we have Infernal Darkness. This is an enchantment with the mana cost of 2 and 2 black. It has a cumulative upkeep of 1 black and 1 life. It has the ability where, if a land is tapped for mana, it produces black mana instead of mana of any other type. While on the field, Darkness is basically an even more powerful Blood Moon. Not only does it restrict your opponent to 1 color mana, but unlike Blood Moon, it even stops their basic lands from producing the right color mana. This means that, if your opponent isn't playing black, they'll basically be completely unable to cast anything. While Infernal Darkness compares favorably to Blood Moon and power level on the field, it's ultimately been a lot less successful than Blood Moon has. The main reason for this is the fact that it costs one more mana than Blood Moon and the cumulative upkeep cost. In Legacy, there's currently a deck called Mono Red Prison, whose game plan is to play a lock piece like Blood Moon on turn 1 using a card like Sibian Spirit Guide or Chrome Mox to get extra mana and then play a threat like Goblin Rabble Master to end the game quickly. Due to the combination of the higher mana cost and cumulative upkeep cost, you can't really play Infernal Darkness in this way. It's simply too hard to get Darkness out on turn 1, and too difficult to play a threat and end the game quickly on the following turn. 
It wouldn't necessarily matter that you have to pay the cumulative upkeep cost if it were a bit easier to end the game in the next few turns. Even two or three turns of your opponent not being able to play the game is more than enough if you're able to take advantage of them. But if you try to ramp darkness out on turn one, you'll usually be using your entire turn to keep it up. Whereas if you played on turn four, you can often continue making plays without much issue. This is why the main place Infernal Darkness has seen play is in Dual Commander. This is the much less popular 1v1 variant of Commander, and in this format, it's far more likely you'll be able to find enough time to play Infernal Darkness on turn 3 or 4. Since you cast the card later in the game, it's also a lot easier to follow up on the card being played and end the game quickly. This solves a lot of the issues that made Infernal Darkness a lot harder to use than Blood Moon, so it's not that surprising that the card has seen so much success in that format. And at number 7, we have Dystopia. This is an enchantment with the mana cost of 1 and 2 black. It has cumulative upkeep costs of pay 1 life, and the ability where, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, the player sacrifices a green or white permanent. Dystopia is really hard to play against if you're only playing green and white cards. If you can't put at least two green or white permanents on the field, it's usually worth not playing anything, as you'll simply have to sacrifice in the beginning of your next upkeep anyway. On top of that, the cumulative upkeep here is the easiest to pay we've seen so far. One of the oldest pieces of wisdom and magic is the only life point that matters is the last one. As long as you're not dead, paying life to get rid of your opponent's board or stop them from feeling comfortable developing your board is almost always the right play. Now, despite how strong this card is, there are a few things holding it back. First off, Dystopia is mostly a sideboard card, as you don't know what colors your opponent is on until after the game starts. On top of that, Dystopia is only legal in Legacy and Vintage, where paying 3 mana for a card is a very tall order. On top of that, there's a lot of competition for Dystopia in these formats, and there's usually just another card that does its job better for most decks and in most metagames. Not to mention, green and white often haven't been at the top of Legacy's metagame, so you don't often need to be playing extra hate for them. As a result, Dystopia has had a pretty limited amount of success, occasionally appearing in the sideboard of Legacy decks that really want help against green and white decks. Still, the card's effect is very powerful, and if it were allowed in the formats that were more focused on the board rather than the stack, it would see a lot more success. And at number 6, we have Thought Lash. This is an enchantment with the mana cost of 2 and 2 blue. It has cumulative upkeep of X on the top card of your library. It has the abilities where, when it leaves the battlefield, you exile your library, and you can exile the top card of your library to prevent the next one damage that would be dealt to you this turn. Thought Lash has a very weird mechanic where it basically turns your library into a life total. While this could potentially be useful, the actual way this card has seen play has been as a way to exile your entire library. Because of how the ability works, you can actually activate Thought Lash before you're going to take damage on your turn. In fact, you can just activate it even if you won't be taking any damage at all that turn, and just activate it until your entire library is exiled. Normally, this would just make you lose the game, but there are some cards that can turn it into an upside. You see, there are cards in Magic like Jace, Wielder of Mysteries, and Thassa's Oracle that can win you the game right away if you have an empty library. It turns out that Thought Lash is one of the best ways to get rid of your entire library really quickly in Legacy. Together, these cards have seen play as a fairly strong combo deck that's able to win the game pretty quickly. However, while Thought Lash is one of the best ways to get rid of your library, there are a few cards that can do a bit of a better job at it. Specifically, Doomsday. This is a sorcery the mana costs of 3 black that lets you search your graveyard and library for 5 cards. You exile all other cards in your graveyard and library, and then stack the top 5 cards of your library however you want, then you lose half your life. Because Doomsday costs 1 less mana and gives you an incredible card selection, Doomsday variants of the deck have been more popular and successful, so Thought Lash takes a bit of a low spot on this list. And at number 5, we have Illusions of Grandeur. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 3 and 1 blue. It has cumulative upkeep of 2 mana, and the abilities where, when it enters the battlefield, you gain 20 life, and when it leaves the battlefield, you lose 20 life. This card is similar to Thought Lash, where instead of being used for its intended purpose, it was used as part of a combo deck. You see, Illusion's second ability doesn't care how it entered the battlefield only who controls it and if it leaves the battlefield. So, what you could do is combine this card with Donate, a sorcery the mana costs a 2 and 1 blue with the effect where the target player gains control of a target permanent you control. By giving your opponent illusions, you would get to gain 20 life, then your opponent would have to pay its ever-increasing cumulative upkeep costs or lose 20 life, which would usually kill them right there, unless they had found a way to gain some extra life somewhere along the way. Because the upkeep cost is increased by 2 every turn, it would quickly outpace the amount of lands they had. This formed the basis of a deck called Tricks. This is another deck in the tradition of naming combo decks after breakfast food. The name comes from the bunny in the art for illusions, which players connected to the Trick serial mascot. Anyway, this deck never saw any success in Legacy, as the format was far too fast for it and it wasn't legal in Modern. The only place this combo ever saw play was in Extended, a now discontinued format. Extended was basically just standard but with more sets and cards, 
and fulfilled the same role that Pioneer and to some extent Modern do in the current day. As a result, this deck was only really playable for a couple of years, as once Illusions rotated out of the format, it was no longer possible to do the combo. And the combo didn't really have a home anywhere else. Still, the Trix combo has more than left its mark on the MTG community. And at number 4, we have Elephant Grass. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 1 green. It has the cumulative upkeep of 1 mana. It has the abilities where black creatures can't attack you, and non-black creatures can't attack unless their controller pays an additional 2 mana for each creature that attacks you. Elephant Grass is really good at stalling the game for just a couple of turns to help you find a win. Oftentimes, players won't have the extra 2 mana to pay to attack you, or if they do, they'll only be able to attack with one of their mana creatures. This is especially true in Legacy, the home of Elephant Grass, where games are very short and 2 mana is often your entire turn. In Legacy, Grass's main home is Enchantress decks. These are decks that play cards like Agorthian Enchantress and Enchantress's Presence, which allows you to draw a card each time you cast an enchantment spell. Combining that with Sarah's Sanctum, a land that taps for 1 white with each enchantment you control, you can make a ton of mana start drawn through your deck very quickly. These decks often take a few turns to really get rolling, so they need cards like Elephant Grass or the other Stax X effects to slow down the game long enough for them to get to their combo turn. Unfortunately for Grass, Enchantress decks haven't been all that great in Legacy for a while. They've recently received a boost in power thanks to Destiny Spinner being printed, a 2 man enchantment creature that makes it so that your creatures and enchantment spells can't be countered, but this hasn't made them a top contender in the format. And at number 3, we have Mind Harness. This is an enchantment aura with a mana cost of 1 blue. It has enchant red or green creature and has cumulative upkeep of 1 mana. And it has the ability where you control the enchanted creature. This is the cheapest control magic effect in the game. Stealing one of your opponent's threats, or even their best threat for only 1 mana, is an incredible deal. Most of these effects cost around 4 mana, and some of the cheaper versions of these effects cost 3 mana. Even accounting for the cumulative upkeep cost, Mind Harness is easily the most efficient version of this effect. Now, the real thing holding Mind Harness back is being restricted to only being able to enchant red or green creatures. While this does restrict the card card a bit, Harness was still able to steal some really valuable targets like Tarmogoyf. While the upkeep cost is steep, stealing a high value target will often let you put so much pressure on your opponent that you'll usually be able to end the game before the upkeep cost starts to hurt you too much. Like a lot of these cards, Harness is only legal in formats like Legacy and Vintage, and that also hurt Harness quite a bit. Fair, creature-based decks are a lot less popular in those formats than in something like Modern, and have been becoming less and less popular over the last few years. As a result, Harness has been seeing less and less play over the last several years and has almost entirely stopped seeing play in the modern day. And at number 2, we have Mystic Remora. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 1 blue. It has cumulative upkeep of 1 mana and the ability where, whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays 4. Paying 4 mana for each non-creature spell you cast is basically impossible. So Remora basically allows you to draw a card for every non-creature spell your opponent casts. Considering how powerful and common non-creature spells are in formats like Legacy and Vintage, Remora will usually draw you a ton of cards. While this card is an incredibly powerful effect, it hasn't been quite as successful as you might think. You see, the issue is that there are just enough decks in formats like Legacy that don't play non-creature spells that you can't confidently play this card in your main board. And if you're planning on sideboarding it in, there are usually just better options. A lot of the time, it's usually just better to stop your opponent from casting those spells in the first place. A lot of the time, if your opponent is on some kind of combo deck, even if you have a lot of cards in your hand, they'll often be able to combo off and win through your remoras perfectly fine. As a result, a lot of the time, players would rather play cards like Thorn of Amethyst that actually stopped them from doing their combos at all. This has stopped the card from seeing too much success in Legacy. However, there are two formats that this card is much better suited for, specifically Vintage and Commander. Vintage is a format defined by the Power 9 and other extremely powerful fast mana cards. As a result, you can much more confidently play the card and know you'll draw a lot of cards off of it. However, the place where this card really shines is in Commander, especially CEDH, the competitive side of the format. This card scales really well with having multiple opponents, as it will draw you three times as many cards as it normally will. This makes it such an efficient draw spell that it became a staple in that format. While the card has seen a ton of success in two of Magic's most powerful formats, there is one card that's just a bit more consistently powerful. And at number 1, we have Glacial Chasm. This is a land with a cumulative upkeep of pay to life. It has the abilities where, when it enters a battlefield, you sacrifice a land. Creatures you control can't attack, and you prevent all damage that would be dealt to you. Chasm is a great stall card. Paying some life each turn to stop your opponent from winning is extremely powerful, at least in certain circumstances. There is the issue of having to sort of call your shot early, needing to play the card on your own turn and guess if it's necessary beforehand. 
Luckily, there are ways to get this card out at instant speed, specifically cards like Crop Rotation and Elvish Reclaimer. This allows you to wait for your opponent to commit to an action before tutoring out Chasm and really blowing them out. If your opponent commits to a big attack or a big combo turn that would deal a ton of damage to you, finding Chasm at instant speed can completely ruin their game plan. Stopping you from being able to attack doesn't really matter, since Cumulative Upkeep gives you a built-in way to sacrifice it whenever you need to. You can just sit and wait behind your Chasm until you build up a big enough board to win the game, and then sacrifice Chasm during your upkeep and get in for lethal. While this is an incredibly strong effect, the downside of having to sacrifice one of your own lands when you play it makes it a bit difficult to play in the average deck. As a result, the main place that Chasm sees play is in the sideboard of lands, decks, and legacy. These are decks built around getting powerful lands like Chasm, the Tabernacle at Pendril Vale, and the Dark Depths combo into play by using these powerful land tutors. Chasm is right at home in these decks, and because of how many land tutors the deck runs, it can get away with only playing a single copy of the card to tutor it out whenever they need it. Chasm has pretty consistently been featured in some builds of land decks and legacy, and seeing so much consistent play easily makes it the strongest cumulative upkeep card. Alright, that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or have ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, please leave it down in a comment down below.